Okay, so let's begin our first class on the laws of Shabbat. <laughs> you okay? I'm like, yeah, I'm like, yeah. Camera comes on, I'm all lights in action. Okay, this is for people who don't have the benefit of being in the class, so we basically just do it with them. Okay. Um, let's begin with the first page. So open your books, and this will be your Bible for the next number of weeks that we are together studying. Please turn to page one. The bottom uh, right-hand corner of the page is the numbers we'll be looking at and going through. The bottom right-hand corner. So page one has a collection of 39 activities. 39 activities. Can you see them? They are divided up. How are they divided up? Into how many groupings? Oh, hey, this is interactive class, by the way. Most of you don't know me yet. That's a question. They're not rhetorical. I'll take answers, okay? There's no such thing as a stupid question. So you always ask questions as well. They divide up into four groups. Can you see that? Yeah. The first group are called Sudur de Pas, which means the order, the Seder, which means the order, of Pas, which is, or Pat, which is bread. Okay? We're going to include into that, as we're going to see, herbs and uh, some which are herbs, but also bread. That's the first grouping. That's going to take us 1 through 11. Then there's a second grouping when it comes to the laws of Shabbat, and that's going to take us from 12 to 23, and that's the order of wool garments no, wool no? garments yeah 12 to 23 24 12 to 23 we've done 1 to 12 now 12 to 23 24. I remember from that 23 and then 24 goes to the next column it starts over here oh to 24 I'm sorry you're absolutely right I'm sorry Mechila you're absolutely right 12 to 24 Korea is the last one tearing thank you so much and that's the order of wool garments then we're going to go from 25 to 31, thank you Shani, which is the order of hides, which is basically um, hides are animal products and all the things we're going to do with animals and can't do with animals. And the final grouping are the order of construction, Sudur de Binyan, construction, all forms of building, 32 to 39. Okay? What are these 39 things known as and why? I'll take an answer. I'm so proud of you, Marjorie. Three years with me, still haven't got that. Three years now? Two, yeah? Three. Okay, three years. So, Shabbat, halacha, is basically taking a journey through 39 categories. Okay, we're going to get through a lot of them. In my 10 years of teaching here, I've never managed to get through all of them, but that's okay. Right? We'll get through as many as we can. 39, by the way, are sometimes referred to by the letters. How do you say 39 in Hebrew letters? Lamed Tet. Okay, so Lamed Tet, like that. That does not mean anything, it's just 39. Okay. And that's what you're going to need. By the way, any words are right on the board. In Hebrew, you're expected to know and understand. Okay? So these are known as the 39 Ma La. Chot. Mem, lamet, alachot, bab, taf, malachot. The singular of malachot are malacha. You're going to hear this word a lot this semester. The word malacha. What does the word malacha actually mean? Not all at once. What does the word malacha actually mean? It's not a trick question, but it's a little tricky. See, this is someone who's been through my classes before. You see that? She's up, she's making points. Yes, Marjorie. Creative work. Creative work. How do you say work in Hebrew, somebody? Avoda. What's the difference? What was your name? Ora. Ora, it's a beautiful name. Ora. What is the difference between Avoda and Malacha? Both seem to mean work, right? What's Avoda? A normal day kind of work. A normal day kind of work. Just like, like going to work. You know, like everyday kind of thing. So has to be like where do we see that word? The way, to, the way to figure out where words come from is try to see where else we see that word in context. In Anywhere else? From where? In the Islam. No, not so much. A little bit. What did you say? Mitzrayim. 
How did Mitzrayim end up over here? What do we see in Mitzrayim? <laughs> Avdut, that's right. Avadim Hayinu Be'ere. I'm not going to sing too much for you this semester, don't worry. Because I do have a fantastic voice, I know, but I want to torture you with it. Avadim Hayinu Be'Mitzrayim. What were the Jews doing in Mitzrayim in Egypt? That they were referred to as Avadim. Were we accountants, all right? <laughs> no, right? We were laborers. What were we laboring with? Physical work. Bricks! Shepping bricks. I know, eventually, Jews start with the bricks, then they become the manager, then they own the company, then they become accountants and lawyers and all the rest of it. But our beginnings were very, very humble. Our beginnings were brick schleppers. Let's not forget that before we get too full of ourselves as a people, right? We were brick schleppers. You wanted to say something? Yeah. What's your name? So I have to learn the names. Hannah. How many? Hannah. Hannah. Yes, Hannah. Uh, I was asking for surgery, but... It could be an Evan. What does an Evan usually do for a person? They serve them, they serve them. Is it sitting back with their feet up doing nothing? No, they're schlepping stuff as well. Absolutely. An Evan is a servant, it's a slave. It could be for somebody else, but I think Malachas um, for yourself and Evan is for somebody else. You could do Avodah for yourself and you could do Malachas for somebody else or yourself. It's rhyme though, Avodah. Usually you're you're doing, usually you're doing work, but you could Avodah for yourself. You could schlep your own bricks. But it's hard graft. It's hard graft. Are you allowed to do avodah on Shabbat? Let's just start with that. Can you do avodah on Shabbat? Yes. I'm going to pick on you. You said yes. Why did you say yes? Um, I, it was mostly a guess. <laughs> That's okay. Because it's just not malacha. It's not malacha. It's so. Okay, so how's the difference? What then is malacha? If this is hard work, what is this thing over here? So well, let's use that word which you use a lot, which is creative. We're creating something over here. Okay. So really there's no word, English word, that's going to suffice the word malacha. Okay, it's going to be a whole multitude of different other words that us figure around different examples and scenarios. It's going to be a lot of stuff. By the end of the semester, you're going to get it. Okay. What else? What other word can we use maybe though? Just to pick one word. For malacha, creative. What else? That does it. Maybe constructive. And let's just use, um, let's use hard, let's use a oh, physical word for this one. Yeah, for Abu Dhabi. Again, that's not good enough, but it's kind of get us through this, uh, these points. Let me ask you, what's your name? Goldie. Goldie. Um, my daughter has that name. I just remembered that. One of my daughters has that name. <laughs> has a second name. Yeah, it's Chaviva Golda. I use a hover in Hebrew? No. Just Golda? Goldie? Goldie. Very nice. Um, Goldie, let's say a person is doing Avodah. Are they doing Malacha as well? Um, if you're doing Avodah, are you necessarily doing Malacha? Not necessarily. Not necessarily. For example, you may be... Writing homework. Is that Malacha or Avodah writing homework? Yeah. No, no, it's okay. Don't worry. This is good. This is good. Trust me, I'm a professional. Okay. Writing homework. Is that Avodah Malachah? Well, Malachah is not the type of Avodah. That's the question. Is, there a type of, is Malachah a type of Avodah? Yeah. You think it is? Yeah. Is Malachah always Avodah? No. Writing homework. Is that constructive or physical? Constructive. Constructive. Is it a physical work? Yeah. No. Well, no. well, you're actually physically doing something, but is it hard physical work? No, it's not, is it? How about this? Is a person that's Avodah necessarily Malacha? Um, me carrying this table up from the fourth floor to the tenth floor of Stone College. Is that Avodah? Yeah. yeah. Is that Malacha? No, no. Why is it not? Why is it not Malacha? What's your name? Rivka. Rivka, why is it not Malacha? You will I know. Why is it not? Um, well, because you can do hard work like that, you can carry within the boundaries of your own house or property. Or You're giving me building. laws of Shabbat. I'm gonna, we're going to come back. I know oh, this is very common, by the way. People have a lot of stuff they've heard and stuff in the past, which is good. I want to unwrap it, unpack it, and get to the basis of it. I'm taking this table up to the fourth floor. Is it Avodah? Is it hard work? Yeah. Yeah. Is it Malacha? Is well, it creative? No, you're not creating anything. I'm not creating anything, am I? I'm just moving a table. 
Right? I haven't created. Have I changed the table in any way? No. no. All I've done is shifted this table. On Shabbat, we're going to see the Torah tells us a number of times, La tasu malacha. You cannot do malacha. It does not say you cannot do avodah unless that avodah is also malacha. You could have something which is both malacha and avodah. You can give an example that is malacha and avodah. To hunt. To hunt and trap an animal, yeah, very good. Shani, excellent. Yeah. To hunt will be an example of that. We're gonna see that trapping animals and killing animals, that can be hard work, you could schwitz doing that, you know what I'm saying? That would be a problem of malacha, but it's also a problem of avodah. So the two could be mutually exclusive. How do I know all this? How do I know that the word malacha actually means creative work? Where do we know this from? I just told you that, and you're, you know, you're buying it, which is good and, and helpful, but how do we know? How do rabbis know it? Okay, let's have a look inside. Turn over your pages, please. To page two, the bottom right hand corner. Okay. So there are a number of sources that we're going to look at, and we're going to end up with a malacha idea. Please follow inside. First of all, one of the forms of malacha on Shabbos, this one of these creative actions, we're going to figure it out exactly where, why, how, what, when, all the rest of it. That's going to be very important. Transgresses a negative commandment. Okay, what well, we call it referred to in Hebrew as Mrs. Losase. How many mitzvahs ase do we have? How many mitzvahs los ase do we have? Except Marjorie, because she listens so well in other classes. How many mitzvahs ase do we have? Yeah. 365 los ase. How many ases do we have? Well, 613 minus 365 becomes 248. 248. That's absolutely correct. So some mitzvahs end up getting a little bit of both. You can have one mitzvah, like Shabbat, where you have mitzvahs ase and mitzvahs los ase. You can have, and Pesach is the same by the way. Mrs. A say Pesach, he matzah, right? Four cups of wine. Okay, that's a Durabanan, but okay. He got a bit read the Haggadah. And Sipor is the rhyme. That's an assay. But there's also a Losa say during Chametz. So we have one mitzvah, but it branches out to more. Shabbat is going to be the same. There's going to be assays and Losa says. This course is about the Losa says. Right, what you should not be doing on Shabbat. Are you with me? Great. So performing a malacha on Shabbat transgresses the negative commandment, which is mentioned in, funnily enough, this week's Pasha, which is? Yisro. That's right. Also my bonus for Pasha, because my birthday on Thursday. Thank you so much. I'm taking gifts from all of you. Okay. And it says in Pasha's Yisro, for the Yom HaShvi, and on the seventh day, Shabbos la Shem alakecha. It is Shabbos to the Lord your God. La sa sekol malacha. Don't be doing malacha. My day. Okay. Do not perform any malacha. This negative commandment is actually repeated eleven times in the Bible. Now we can make an assumption: if something is mentioned a number of times, it's really important. Okay. You could have told me once. Told me twice. When my wife tells me ten times, take the garbage out. I'm in trouble already, you know what I'm saying? We're past the fifth warning. Okay, the Torah, same thing. Mentioned a bunch of times, so 11 times over there. By refraining from Malacha on Shabbos, ladies, you fulfill a positive commandment of For six days you should do your actions, but on the seventh day you shall rest. So actually by fulfilling these mitzvahs of not doing Malacha, you're doing a positive commandment which is to rest. So we're defining what rest is. Rest, for most of us, is not having homework, not going to class, and sleeping in, because that's what you do at college, right? However, rest on Shabbos means the refraining from doing malacha. Actually, it also means to refrain from avodah as well. You should be physically at rest as well, as much as possible, okay? So we have the philosophical ideas, we're 1B, Right, why do we keep Shabbos? By the way, I do an entire course, which is the semester before this one, at the lower intermediate level, on the uh, reasons why we keep Shabbat. But you're not going to get it from me this semester, because that's a whole semester in and of itself, right? 
the reasons for it, and there's a lot to it, but just to summarize it, Shabbat is a testimony for the Jewish people. Right? We testify to God's existence. Anyone know what we do on Shabbat, which is a proof that it's a testimony? What do we do? At what point? Yeah? Kiddush. We make Kiddush. How do we make Kiddush? Standing up, right? Just like a person in a court of law testifies, so too on Shabbat we make testimony. In. Shabbat is actually the only, I believe, mitzvah in the Ten Commandments where you actually do stuff, actions. It's ceremonial stuff connected to it. Because Shabbat made it into the top ten. At number... At number... Four. Four. Thank you so much. My girls is always far ahead of everybody else. Yes. Uh, commandment number four out of ten is you should keep Shabbat. Okay? Great. Um, it is also referred to as a Brit between Hashem and the Jewish people. Right? It is the connection. And as I mentioned last semester, those who were with me, those who were not, Shabbat actually defines a Jew. It's quite incredible if you think about it. We don't define a person. Is that person observant? We're like, yeah, they're a sukkah dweller. They're a matzah eater. They're a charity giver. Oh, wonderful mitzvah. We don't define a Jew by those mitzvah. How do we define a Jew? Are they Shomer Shabbos? Are they Shomer Shabbat? Not we actually define them that way. How do we define an observant Jew? I'm oh. An observant Jew. A Jew, you're, 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 you're in whether you like it or not. <laughs> right? But an observant Jew is, are you Shomer Shabbat or Shomer Shabbat? It's amazing, that. That's like, that's like the archetypal definition of an observant Jew. Now, the word Shomer, let's just go to that word for a minute, if you don't mind. The word Shomer is connected to another word in relation to Shabbat, which is, you need to write this all down, by the way, which is Zachor, right? So there's Shamor, put it there for intent purposes, Shamor and Zachor. Zachor means to remember. Shamor means to remember. Shamor means to guard. What's the difference between Shamor and Zachor? They were said both together, right? They appear on the set of Dibrot, on the two different versions, one of Pasha's Yisro, one of Pasha's Bez Hanan. One time it says Shamor is a Shabbos, time it says Zachor is a Shabbos. And they were said Dibrot together. Why do we do that? What are they to remember? They, they are code words. What are they code words for? I shed nachas from you, I really do. For Asel no Sasei. How do you remember something? How do you remember Yisis Misraim on Pesach? By doing stuff. We talk about it, we eat the matzah. So memory isn't just sitting down remembering, we activate the memory. It's active memory. Right? We do stuff. So on Shabbos, how do we Zachor? We make Kiddish, we make Abdullah, we have the Sudas, all the rest of stuff that goes with it. That's the Zachor. So Zachor is a code word for Mitzvah's Ase. Mitzvah's Ase. The Mitzvah's Ase, which we said is involved in Shabbat as well. So what's Shamor? What's Shamor? Help me, help me. How'd you do that? It's like, you didn't move your lips and the answer came out, like a ventriloquist. <laughs> this refers to, how do you guard, what does guard mean? I guard something by not letting it become broken. Uh -huh. You guard something by, by, by protecting it. So Shamor is a low Ase. Okay, so all the assays of Shabbat are over here, not our course this semester, but over here we are Shamor, we are guarding. So Shomer Shabbat means I'm guarding Shabbos from breaking one of the 39 Malachah. Now at this point, we got no idea whether there's 39 of them. All we know so far is that a thing called Malachah. That Malachah stuff you could do all week, but you can't do on Shabbos. When you refrain from Malachah, you're being Shomer Shabbos. And you're really becoming an observant Jew. That's the interconnecting connection, which actually is only for Jews. Non-Jews, we say, cannot keep Shabbat. The person who converts, we say, never said it, but people who convert don't keep Shabbat right to the end. Right? It's exclusively a Jewish mitzvah. If non-Jews want to give charity, prod to fill in, go right ahead, I'm not going to stop you. But Shabbos, no. Shabbos has to be exclusively the Jewish people. It's a very personal relationship one to the other. And we said that when a person keeps Shabbat, they're actually fulfilling Shabbat and Zachor, but by not breaking Shabbat, they are protecting it by not breaking the 39 Malachat. 39. Where does that come from? How do we know to define Malachat? So there are a number of reasons for this. Number one is tradition, which sounds like a song from... Ah, oh, Fiddle on the Roof. 
which by the way was my school play, thinking about it right now. Fiddle on the Roof, you know that song? Oh, you know, Fiddle on the Roof. This is like a staple. Every Jew in America watches this and that becomes their Judaism. There's a song called Tradition there. Tradition. Masorah. Masorah. Tradition. Remember that tradition? Um, I actually played the role of Tevye. Actually, to be fair, there were too many kids in my class at 11 years old. So they divided the Tevye role into three. Tevye, Levy, and Devye. And Golda was Golda, Skolda, and Molda. I am not kidding you. I was actually Devya. <laughs> but I got to sing Lachayim, which was one of the best songs. Right? Lachayim, Lachayim. Go home and watch that movie, Shani. Do me a favor. I don't know what they're doing in Israel. I don't know what watching. Go home and watch on YouTube. This <coughs> classic. You know Topol? The singer Topol? Wow, new generation. Okay. Someone is the Masora. This tradition, right behind down, the Gemara, the Maradrashim, we know the, the Malacha. Okay, that's not one. Number two, there is a juxtaposition which is a fancy way of saying juxtaposition next to each other. Samuch. When two things are put next to each other in the Torah, in the Bible, they're usually connected. When two things are samuch next to each other in the Torah, just like a blueprint of a building, I look at the blueprint, I see a faucet. I then see an object underneath it, which is a sink. Two completely different things. One's a faucet, one's a sink. But the fact that they're next to each other means they're related. The faucet lets the water into the sink. Okay? They are juxtaposed one to the other. I couldn't have figured that out just looking at the blueprint, because I've never seen a faucet before, I've never seen a sink before. Because I come from wherever. Okay? But when the faucet empties out of the sink, I see the relationship. The Torah will have the exactly the same. When things are put next to each other, they are somach, they are connected. That happens a lot. Rashi, many times in the commentary, will do that with certain episodes in the Torah. When certain episodes appear in the Torah, which normally seem completely unrelated, you say, actually, they are related in a philosophical and even a halachic way. Let's have a look at an example of that. The juxtaposition of Shabbos to Mishkan is in Parshas Vayakal. And in Parshas Vayakal, we see that Shabbos is mentioned, and then right next to it, the Mishkan is mentioned. And then it says the Mishkan should not be built on Shabbos. Because remember, the Mishkan, which we're going to talk about in a second, was broken down and built up how many times? 42. There were 42 journeys in the desert. That means it had to be packed down and built up 42 times. There were 42 journeys for the Jewish people, men based journeys the Jewish people took in the desert. So there we are, slept around the desert. With this thing called the Mishkan, what it's made up of, we'll see. Actually, our entire semester is going to be what's in the Mishkan, actually. It's actually what we're learning. We're actually learning Mishkan. But the Mishkan, we shall see, had to be broken down, dismantled, reassembled. It had to be, first of all, made. The bits and pieces had to be made. Then when it's made, it had to be dismantled, put together, dismantled, put together, boop, 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 at least 42 times, around 42 times. Okay. It says, by the way, you assemble it again, like Ikea, right? when you assemble it again, you can't do that on Shabbos. Not only that, this is the key point, it says, don't do Malach on Shabbat. And when it comes to the Mishkan, that's Malacha. Whoa, now that's a biggie. That's a big one. Let's think about that for a second. I don't know what Malacha is. I know I can't do it on Shabbos, but how am I meant to know? What does it say what Malacha is? No problems. I find the word somewhere else in the Torah and see what it's applying to. So Moshe Rabbeinu was told to find someone, which he did, to build the Mishkan. And he built parts of it himself. To build the Mishkan. And what does it say? That's going to take Malacha. Actually, it says it's Malachet Machsheves. Malachas Machshavet or Malachet Machshavet. Now, what's that? We'll see in a minute. We're just focusing on the Malacha part. Building the Mishkan and assembling it takes Malacha. So, what can't I do on Shabbos? Put the Mishkan together. Right? Whatever's involved in building and assembling, because it was built once, then it had to be repaired, then it had to be assembled. Whatever's involved in building, it and assembling it is malacha. 
I now know what I cannot do on Shabbat. What do I do? Go visit the Mishkan. Check it out. What's involved over there? You know what's involved? 39 separate activities. 39 separate activities. Where are those activities written? Not in the Torah. They're all written in the Talmud. Mishnah and Talmud. The actual Gemara refers to the laws of Shabbat as mountains hanging on sarot, on strings, on hairs. We're going to get so many laws, so many laws from little extra words and small ideas, but it's all loaded up in the Gemara. Okay? It's a very oral Torah loaded thing. And there's something else really weird about Shabbat, since we're on the topic, which we're going to be for the next few months. And it goes like this. Um, do you think you would be able to keep Passover by not studying the laws? You probably could. You watch your mother, your father, right? They clean up, right? You go to the stores, you buy stuff that's kosher pesa, right? You see people eat matzah, and you just eat the matzah. I mean, there's a lot of laws. And if you want to do it properly, you've got to know the halacha. But it's possible that you could watch it and learn by osmosis. Right? Remember osmosis when you just kind of absorb it in. It's possible. Are you with me on that one? It's possible. I, I don't, you never really said the laws of Shabbat. But you watch your mother, she does this, does that. You mess up a little bit, you ask a couple of questions, but you can figure it out. But you can see and kind of figure out, could you learn the laws of tzedakah, charity, by not studying the laws of tzedakah? Just watching someone else do it? Yeah, you just take a hand in your pocket, take out some cash and pay. <laughs> Give the guy some money or cost some money. Could you know what to do with the law of an esrog by not studying the laws of the law of an esrog? Yeah, you just pick up the citron, the etrog, pick up the other three minim, you stick it together, make the blessing, and you shake. And you're done. Shabbat is really weird. It's really weird. You think, you think you can watch other people keep Shabbat and learn it that way. And by the way, to a large degree, you can. But then there's something really weird. You can have two people doing exactly the same act in the same way. One of them is doing a mitzvah and the other one is transgressing Shabbat totally and is chayav mitah, liable for the death penalty. You don't see that anywhere else, right? Well, only one of the area, interestingly, the avodah in the Mishkan, but we'll leave that aside. We'll leave that aside. You have two people doing exactly the same act, in the same way. One of them is doing a like, and the other one is breaking Shabbat, transgressing it totally. Doraisa. I'll give you an example. Two people are sitting in front of a bowl. Both of these bowls have a mixture of peanuts and raisins. Peanuts and raisins. One of them loves raisins. The other one doesn't. One person puts their hands in and takes out the raisins because they don't want them. And they put them to the side. The other person takes out the raisins, same act, same way. Why are they taking the raisins? Because they love them and just want to eat the raisins. One of them has transgressed Shabbos totally. And the other one's done a fantastic thing. The same act. Raisin extraction from bowl of peanuts and raisins. Why? Because we're going to see there's going to be a halacha called bore, a separation. And when things, small things that are mixed together, you cannot take the psal from the yoch. You cannot take things you don't want from the you do want. You've got to take the stuff you do want from the stuff you don't want. You can take the yoch from the psalas, can't take the psal from the We'll see those words later on, the ideas, just the idea itself. So we have two people doing the exact same act in the same way. What's the difference? The machshav, right? What is their kavana when they do it? One is it because they want something, and one is it because they don't want something. So you have two exactly the same acts. It's imp now, if I'm watching that scene, I would never know. There's just no way of knowing. They're both doing the same thing, but different reasons. One wants the raisins, one doesn't want the raisins. So that's a weird aspect of Hilchah Shabbat. 
that a simple act like that, and by the way, just the severity of it, which by the way is out of character the rest of the Torah, right? and the rest of the Torah, you don't do such severe things and get punished for them. Right? You don't see that anywhere else except in the Mishkan, where a small act has major... You steal something. You return it, you may get fined. No one's cutting your hand off, heaven forbid. No one's beating you up. Right? That's not the Jewish way. Right? You get told off, you do tshuva, you pack You burn a safe Torah, chas v'shalom. You get lashed. You take out the raisins, you don't want them. Chayv skila. One of the four beat up they one of the four ways that a person is put to death in Judaism. Not that we do it, and not that it happens very often at all, but at least in theory, and it's the worst of the four. Stoning. It's very unusual. It's extreme. The Mishkan was similar, by the way, in the Beit Amigdash. Small actions, big. It shows the Shabbat thing is very, very Meduyak, very, very detailed. And you've got to learn it. There's just no way to keep Shabbat unless you learn it. You can't watch it. It's not visible. Okay, let's finish off. So, once again, we said the Malachat is from the Mishkan, and in the Mishkan, there were 39 activities. Where are these 39 activities listed? In the first page of the book. There you go. And those are the four orders. 1 through 11, 12 through 24, 25 to 31, and 32 to 39. Okay? Those are your 39. Interestingly enough, the word Malacha, ladies, appears 39 times in the Torah. That's what we call a remez. It's a hint. It's cute. Right? Good go. The word Malacha appears 39 times. There were 39 different activities involved in the Mishkan. And actually, they're listed in Gemara Shabbat, Ein Gimel 73. Any questions on anything we've discussed so far? That was the introduction, an important introduction. Let's play a game. Who likes games? Who likes games? You like games? Who doesn't like, who doesn't like a nice game? That's what we do all day on our phones. Okay. Um, turn back to your list of 39. I know we haven't studied them at all, we've gone nowhere near them, and we're not going to start them for a few weeks, a couple of weeks. We have to do a lot of introductions still. Um, are you allowed to write a letter on Shabbos? How do you know? Write a whole letter? Write a letter, write a whole letter, write a whole letter, write a letter to a friend. Dear, with a pen and pen, not, not, not on your phone. Do you even write letters anymore, by the way? Not write letters anymore. Use the paper anymore. Yes, where do you see it? Which number? Kosev. Kosev, Kotev is number? 32. 32, very, very good. Um, are you allowed to put a seed in the ground on Shabbat? No? Give me, give me a, give me a, give me a Malacha name, please. Get used to these names. It sounds crazy. You know all of them 39 by heart by the end of the semester. Aren't you excited for that? Yeah, you don't look it for some reason. Yes. yes, yes. Um, okay. Are you allowed to take raisins out of a mixture of raisins and peanuts if I don't like the raisins? What's the malacha? Oh, rare. Are you allowed... Should we get a little bit difficult now? That was easy, right? Should we use some harder ones? Yeah. Are you allowed to water your plants on Shabbos? Ooh, hello. Me, tricky. Yes or no? No. Are you allowed to take a hose? You sure? Anyone think yes, you can? Say so all you think no. Find me the malacha. What's Zorea? I said, are you allowed to water? And you said to me, you can't put seeds in the ground. Why not? What does that mean? Not just the act of putting seeds into the ground, also the act of like planting it. Very good. We're going to see that these malachot are actually titles and headings. Things were done in the Mishkan in a certain way. Sometimes, actually, always, we're going to say, you can't do that. But then we're going to say, you can't do something that's like it. 
And then we're going to say, you can't do something that has the same result. So each malacha we're going to kind of break down. And don't worry, it may sound tricky. Now when we get to each one, it becomes very, very clear. Okay? The way it was done, something similar to it, and then the same result. I'll give you an example to make that clear. Because I would, I would really, unless this stuff is clear to you right now, we can't even move on. It's got to be very, very clear. Okay? In the Mishkan, they harvested wheat. Okay? Are you allowed to harvest wheat on Shabbat? Totally not. That's the way they did it in the Mishkan. That was the archetypal way. Did they grow melons in the Mishkan? The answer to that is no, by the way. They did not harvest melons in the Mishkan. Am I allowed to harvest melons on Shabbat? Why not? There's nothing about harvesting melons over here. They were just harvesting wheat and olives. Why olives, by the way? What oil? So, where did the Hilchot Melon get involved? Yes? Well, you've got to make sure that it's nothing easy to harvesting wheat. Or There's no wheat anywhere. There's not a lead me to it. There ain't no wheat in the entire country. It's just me and the melons. Can I harvest them? No. So the slippery slope idea, which by the way, that may apply elsewhere. The slippery slope idea of don't do it here, you may do it over there. That protection we're going to see may apply. That, that, that's a valid concept of Shabbat. We're going to show more of that a lot. Okay. The reason can't, because harvesting itself becomes a problem. Okay? The object itself is a problem, but also the way it's done. Not only that, how do you get things to grow? You water them. So the action of seeding helps plants grow. The action of watering a plant helps plants grow. And so both are a bit. But that's a results thing. So you have the original wheat. We have the melons, which was harvesting the same action, but with a different plant, fruit. And we said, by the way, even the a similar action, so that's going to be difficult because it's going to be hard to figure those things out. Then we're going to kind of like go deep into each malach and see, well, is that like this? And then we open ourselves up to different opinions and the way things are done and the way things are not done and then we're going to come to as well. Um, can you, here's a good one. Oh, I like this one. Oh, I feel good. This is a good one to finish the class on. Oh, I'm so excited. I don't have a social life, by the way. This gets me excited. I apologize. Can you ride a bicycle on Shabbos? No. You're a yeah or a no? Unsure. Unsure. Very good. You're an undecided voter. <laughs> right? Do I vote for Hillary? Do I vote for Trump? I'm unsure. Be sure. Um, actually, that's it. It really is. It's, it's, it's a tricky one. Yes. Yes or no? It gets complicated with the chain breaks. What, how do chains get involved in this? Yeah, I love this, by the way. People pick up stuff from the past that they heard before. I, every time someone says that, by the way. And they've been like, what's wrong with chains breaking? Yeah. After what? Who says anything I can't fix a chain on Shabbos? And who says I can't do something because maybe I may come to fix a chain? There was a Takana. We're going to see that you can't play a musical instrument on Shabbos. Because you make and fix a string. They didn't talk about bikes. They spoke about musical instruments. So that concept cannot be switched to bikes. And therefore, that's not going to be the reason I may or may not be able to ride a bike on Shabbos. Because it was made specifically by musical instruments. And some other things, like riding animals. We'll come to that as well. But no chain breakage, because it was made. By Chazal anyway, yeah. So you're like, it's a means of transportation... What we refer to in Hebrew as uvd in the hall, right? But the action itself, am I doing anything wrong when I actually do the action itself? Never mind what it could lead to. That is a real thing, but that's not a malacha. You can never find a malacha in here? Well, the action itself, like riding on the grass and plowing and preparing the land. Wow! What's your name? Adira. Adira. Nice name. Adira says, you're plowing. Somebody argue with Adira in a respectful Torahic way. Not to me, to her. Oh, um, you can avoid going on the grass. So you're saying, well, 
just avoid the graph. So you don't actually disagree with her, you're just telling how to avoid the problem that she's yeah. created. Because someone actually disagree with her? Don't stop leading. You actually actually excel. Yes? I'm not doing like the purpose of plowing. So I'm not doing the purpose of plowing. But I still could be plowing. Yeah, but you aren't. What is plowing? Plowing is when you're doing a field to plant something. You're not doing a field to... Like so you're right. It's not like Kavana, which is important. I don't intend. I want to ride my bike. So you shouldn't walk on grass either then. Like What's in between walking on grass, riding a bicycle or pushing a... Stroller on grass and plowing. Are they different? Are they the same? I need, to, I'm as necessary, you know, I can sit in my house. I mean, necessary. I can't go out there. I'm going to sit in my house the entire Shabbos. Want to get outside? Can't walk on grass. You can't walk on grass, by the way. <laughs> you plow with an instrument? Okay, the instrument in this case is my bicycle or my stroller. Okay, here's an interesting one. Actually, you can actually ride a bike on Shabbos. We don't do it. We don't do it, and it's not done. There have been certain, they say, communities around the world that have done, but technically there's nothing wrong with it. Why is it not Choresh? Choresh is plowing, and it's also, any Persians here? What's Choresh? A yummy food which you plow through. Like that one? Shout out to your family on Shabbos. And you're welcome. That's a good one. Um, plowing means, I'm getting a little technical. Plowing is you dig into the ground with an implement, and that's your kavana. You dig into it. Interesting, riding a bicycle or pushing a stroller or walking, you're not plowing, you are, Katisha, you are pressing. Oh, I always get the high heels quest, usually later in the semester. Fantastic, Adira. High heels. Is high heels plowing? No. You can walk on grass. With high heels. One, it's not your intention. Two, you're not plowing, you're stepping. And that is why you can walk on grass with high heels. Shabbos. And for some reason, every time that comes up, people think you can't. Yes, actually, you can. There's actually no technique because it doesn't appear as Malacha. Malacha says plowing. Here I am pressing. If my intention is to use the high heels for plowing, because I'm going to plow in my backyard and I'm going to make the soil fertile, fertile and the soil is soft, and it's my intention, and I'm walking around, uh, 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 uh. that's a problem. And that would be malacha number one, Horish. But short of that, you are permitted to walk with high heels on soil, on shadows. But when you walk on grass, even if you walk with what, shoes, yes. it's the plan. Fantastic. Says Shani Hava, these advanced students here. I'm feeling good about the semester. I am grinding. What am I grinding? What's grinding? Tochen. <laughs> you said tochen. Oh. Tochen's grinding. What am I? What, what, what am I making tachina out of? Besides that, I mean, if you walk on grass, but like like she asked. Am I grinding? What am I grinding? I'm just pressing the ground. But that's this is how you plant. Tochen is taking an item and grinding it down and pulverizing it into small pieces, duck duck. Yeah, but sometimes you do like that. If you were to have dry soil, dried, on your shoe, that could be a problem. Exclusively by soil, not by other items, we'll see. That could be a problem, yeah. But if my intention is to walk through, and not my intention, I was gonna walk through it. Being a dried dirt on the bottom of my shoe, let it stay there. I'm gonna do a walk through, and walk through, and by air. No problems. If you have a clump of dried soil on the bottom of your shoe, mm, 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 that could be a problem, yeah. Because Chorish is digging into the ground and bicycle is not digging in, you're flattening as you go. And that's why you can push a stroller over the grass, that's why you can wear shoes over the grass. Running through tall grass, we're going to see the problem. But that will be next class, God willing. This was a fantastic introduction. I'm feeling good. I'll see you all on Thursday for my birthday.